Kitchen Studio. This week in Kitchen Studio on the GastroCast, we're cooking trifle. And I thought trifle was a great winter dish. I'm sure it doesn't have to be, but it's something I associate with winter time and as Christmas time especially. Although a funny thing is, a survey I did of trifle recipes uh, yielded the results that quite a few trifles use non-seasonal fruits. Now, that same survey of recipes, probably six or seven, maybe ten different recipes I looked at for trifle, and re remembering the, um, the trifle that I grew up having almost every year at Christmas time, I noticed a trend, and that trend is to make trifles as simple as possible and to use as many manufactured and pre-made things in trifles as possible. And so today on the GastroCast, we are going to throw all that aside and scramble to make a ethical, non-pre-made, wonderful, and hopefully flavorful trifle from ingredients that we should have on hand and not have to run to the store for. Some of the manufactured ingredients that I saw incorporated in trifles run to, and I had to make a list, run to cake mixes, custard powder or tinned custards, store-bought macaroons, or lady fingers that are store-bought and usually quite nasty and stale by the time you get them, uh, glacé cherries, and all sorts of out-of-season summer fruits, raspberries, blueberries, everything required fresh. And I thought, here we are in the, in, in the middle of winter, really, and we want something that is delicious and yummy without being stodgy and horrible or gooey and sickly sweet and gummy. One of the seasonal cheats of trifles, however, which is it's a nice touch and I was tempted to go that route myself, is to use something like raspberry jam as the main fruit in the trifle and roll that up in a jelly roll sort of sponge. And that's okay, but that can lead down the line of being overly sweet. We want a trifle that is well balanced and has some great flavor and elements. And one of the other classic variations for trifle is uh, the, probably the one, and certainly the one I grew up eating, uh, was a sherry trifle. Now, depending on whether you use something like a sweet sherry Harvey's Bristol Cream or a very dry uh, Oloroso's type sherry, uh, you could have a vastly different type experience. And I think it, uh, trifles that use sherry tend to lean towards the sweeter sherries. But I remember years ago making a trifle, trying to copy my family's recipe long time ago and ended up with a sickly sweet gut bomb that was a sugar-fueled drunk fest. Now they don't call trifle tipsy pudding for nothing. It does need to have some kind of alcohol and lots of it. And I've chosen today to go with Contreau, which is an orange flavored liqueur. You can use Grand Marnay. Triple sec would be a little bit too sweet as far as orange liqueurs, and there's other orange flavored liqueurs. You could also use Amaretto or certainly that old standby sherry. But I think that the Contreau used in today's sherry is gonna go well with some of the other ingredients uh, that I've chosen to use. Now I've also decided to stick clear of fresh fruits. We have, it's the middle of winter, we have very few summer fruits available, raspberries and blueberries and whatnot. What we do have that happens to be a very seasonal Christmas fruit are Christmas oranges. And so I've gone with the Satsumas that are just coming into the markets now. Uh, great orange, they're sweet, but with a little edge of tartness, not too juicy or messy and seedless. So I think using those inside our trifle will pair well with the Contreau and the other fruits. And I've decided to steer clear. I looked at some trifle recipes that, like I said, used candied fruits. I looked at some that used dried fruits that just seemed like that could be a disaster waiting to happen. And I found a couple that used canned fruits and I thought that those were very passable. And had I had uh, an abundance of canned fruit, I might have gone that way myself. But what I've decided to go with are frozen fruits. 
Frozen fruits that I'm going to leave frozen as I incorporate them into the trifold. I think they'll thaw out just enough to be delicious uh, when the trifle is served after it comes out of refrigeration. And by not thawing them before we incorporate them into the trifle, we, we don't run the risk of having that kind of soupy, gloopy um, fruit soup, cold fruit soup. Now, which, by the way, which I don't mind. Now I'm using home-picked blueberries and home-picked raspberries that have been in the freezer since the summer. I spread them out on trays. They were individually frozen, so they're easy to apply in a dish like a trifle. I've also got some nectarines that were picked during the summer and frozen in slices. And then we're going to use the segments of mandarin orange. So let's get a start on making the Pod Chef's trifle. We're going to start the trifle by preheating the oven to 355 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 175 degrees Celsius. Next, we need to line two 9-inch cake pans with parchment. Using the pan as a template, cut two parchment circles. Spray both pans with a non-stick cooking spray. I use an organic safflower spray. And then fit the parchment circles to the bottom of each pan. We'll be baking sponge cake, and we need to start by mixing the dry ingredients together. Next, we need to add one ounce of butter to three tablespoons of milk and bring to a boil on the stove. Remove from the heat and add half a teaspoon of vanilla extract. Next, separate three eggs into a mixing bowl, reserving the yolks. Whisk the whites until almost at the soft peak stage. While still mixing, add six tablespoons of sugar and continue whisking until soft peaks are reached. Transfer the egg whites to another bowl and set aside. In the now empty mixing bowl, add the three reserved egg yolks and two additional whole eggs. Add six tablespoons of sugar and place the bowl in the mixer and whisk until pale yellow, light and foamy. Now we're going to add our reserved egg whites and whisk them into the yolk mixture on low for a count of 10. Remove the whisk and sprinkle over the reserved mixed dry ingredients. Replace the whisk and beat on low for another count of 10. Remove the bowl and gently scrape down the sides and turn the batter over a few times. Make a well to one side of the bowl and pour in the cool reserved butter, milk and vanilla. Fold this in gently until incorporated.
Take the prepared cake tins and divide the batter evenly between them. Smooth out the surface for level cakes. Resist tamping these pans on the counter as that will jar out all of the lovely air we've worked so hard to beat into the batter. Now it's time to place the cakes into our preheated oven and bake for about 25 minutes. Once the cakes have baked to a golden brown, they're ready to come out of the oven. You'll know the cakes are done when they spring back to light finger pressure. Remove the cakes to awaiting racks, but don't let them sit for long. They need to be removed from the pans while they're still warm. Now is also the time to peel the parchment from the cakes as well. With the tops of both the cakes on the racks, you may want to flip them over. Don't worry about the grid marks. The tops will be trimmed off later. Now is the time to let the cakes cool. Well, we're going to get started making our pastry cream. And I'm going to put a quart of whole milk into a pot. I'm going to get that started on the heat. I'm going to bring that up to a boil quite gently. Don't want to let it go over the top of the pot or anything like that. But we do need to get that hot and before we add to the next step. Now I've got eight ounces, half a pound of sugar, to which I'm going to add two and a half ounces of cornstarch and a half teaspoon of salt. I'm just going to whisk that in. Get it all mixed together quite nicely. And to this I'm going to add and beat in three eggs, one at a time. Get them in there until they're incorporated. It's a little stiff. <coughs> Once all three eggs are in there, it beats in quite nicely. Get it mixed in there nicely until the sugar starts to dissolve. Now this cornstarch thickened form of pastry cream needs to boil to cook the cornstarch out and we want to make sure to stir it so that it doesn't scorch or stick to the bottom of the pan and it just needs to cook for a few seconds To get the cornstarch flavor out of it, you can see how thick it really is. And we're going to take our pastry cream off the heat, keep stirring it. We're going to pour it into a cold bowl. Once the pastry cream's in the bowl, we want to whisk in 
our teaspoon of vanilla extract. Get it stirred in there nice and good. Now normally I would take this pastry cream and put it somewhere cool until it had cooled down enough and was only just warm and not hot to put in the refrigerator safely. We wouldn't want to put it in right now because it would rise the temperature of the refrigerator up too dramatically and a chance could be of spoiling things in the fridge. But I'm going to cover this with some plastic wrap for the time being and set this aside because for our recipe today we actually want the pastry cream in a warm state, although not as hot as it is right now. Now our next step is to bloom some gelatin to whisk into the pastry cream. It's really quite easy. We're going to take one teaspoon of unflavored powdered gelatin and two tablespoons of cold water and just stir them around until there's no lumps and everything's mixed together. We're going to let that sit until the gelatin swells up in what's process known as blooming. Now that the gelatin is bloomed and is in a solid state, we're going to reliquify it. I've got some boiling water here and I'm just going to set the gelatin in this little pan of little glass of boiling water. And just let the heat soak into it for a minute and let it, the gelatin soften and become liquid again. Meanwhile, I'm going to uncover our pastry cream and get it ready because we're going to want to whisk the liquid gelatin into the pastry cream which is still nice and warm. Gelatin could use a little stirring at this point. Make sure to, to dissolve all the gelatin granules. The last thing we want is a, to introduce granular tasting elements to the pastry cream. Blooming is akin sort of to proofing yeast. We want to make sure that the gelatin is good, but it also does something structural and allows the gelatin to work better later on down the road as it gets cooler. Okay, this is liquid enough. We're going to go ahead and add it to our pastry cream and get it whisked in. Now that gelatin is going to help the pastry cream set and solidify as we chill our trifle. The next step for our trifle is to bring all the diverse elements together into the glass trifle dish. Our sponges have cooled off, are nice and cold, and we need to proceed with the next step, which is to slice the very top, the very crusty, uh, darkened, cooked part of the sponge off to open up the pores of the cake to allow the liquor and all the flavors to intermingle in it. I'm just going to use a large bread knife and slice carefully across the top of the sponge. Easier said than done. Such a delicate cake and a delicate top best and work it off as much as possible. Because this isn't a cake that gets frosted, a little bit of digging in here and there can occur. Now that the top is off our sponge, we can slice it up into bite-sized pieces. And here's really where the versatility of the trifle comes into play because while we made fresh sponge for this, if we'd had leftover sponge or slightly stale cake uh, or cake trimmings as if we, were, uh, if we were working in a bakery and we had cake trimmings from making a shaped cake or something else, we could then employ those in a trifle. And so I've got my trifle dish here at the ready. Trifle dish wants to be straight-sided, 
not sloped, although that can work in a pinch. They're customary to have straight sides and be quite deep. This sort of shape works best. Pedestal or not, your choice. I think the pedestal gives it a little flair. This is a very basic glass dish here that I've got. I'm just going to cut our carefully made sponge cake now that we've gone to all the effort to get it light and delicious. I'm going to cut it into chunks. And start layering the bottom of the trifle dish with them. A few gaps are okay. Once the sponge is on the bottom of the dish, we're going to sprinkle some of our liqueur over the top. And then it's time to spread the pastry cream over this layer of sponge. Now that the custard's in place on top of the sponge, we can go ahead and start adding some of our fruit, reserving enough to make the subsequent layers. Now I've got a selection of frozen fruit, and here's some nectarines that I cut up that are still frozen. And then some of our home-picked raspberries and blueberries. Sprinkle them in around the surface of the custard, pastry cream. I think leaving the fruits still frozen is going to make a big difference in how this comes out. And then finally, I've got some segment, peeled and segmented mandarin oranges, fresh. I think somehow these are somewhat seasonal and will lend an interesting element given the orange flavor of the liqueur we're using. Just a few segments in each layer. Once the fruit layer is done, we're going to go ahead and add another layer of sponge. sponge with the remaining pastry cream. It'll get topped with some whipped cream in a bit. Now we're going to cover this up with a, gently cover this with a layer of plastic wrap and put this in the refrigerator until it's thoroughly chilled.
anywhere up to a couple of hours, and then we'll finish garnishing it. Well, the trifle's done. Chilling from the refrigerator. I'm take this wrap off, and we've got to finish it off. And so I've got about a cup and a half of whipped cream that I've whipped almost to firm peaks. I'm now going to add a little splash of vanilla extract to make what's known as Chantilly cream, vanilla flavored whipped cream. And it's whipping this up. This is unsweetened whipped cream, by the way. We just want it to get to stiff peaks. And I've got a star tip in a pastry bag. Just going to load it up with some of our cream. going to spread a little bit of the leftover whipped cream right around the center, right over that pastry cream. If you want, you can put a couple more stars in the center. And then I thought it might be fun just to decorate the top surface with a little bit of our fruit. shave a little bittersweet dark chocolate over the top of your trifle once it's all finished. Not to go overboard, but just to give it a little variation and a little extra texture. Well there we have it, a Christmas trifle full of delicious fruits and wonderful liqueur. Who says that just because it isn't summer we can't have summer fruits in a dessert? We just have to use our heads and be a little crafty about it. Now that it's decorated, this could be served, or it could be refrigerated for up to a couple of hours. The longer it sits though, the more those frozen fruits are gonna thaw and bleed, making this look a little shop-worn. Nevertheless, it will taste delicious all the same. Well, that's it for this episode of GastroCast TV. Hope you've enjoyed it. Come back again soon. Take care of yourself. Most of all, keep on cooking. Bye now.